Okay, I think that if there are people still entering, they'll enter a little bit late, but we'll start start already so we can get on with our program today. So I just want to say welcome everyone and, and uh, uh, welcome to this third session of the In Conversation with the Finnish Institutes. Uh, this evening's host in institute uh, for this session is uh, uh, the Finnish Culture Institute in New York. Um, today we'll be discussing and looking into dreaming of Black futures. Um, with us uh, today, there's um, Jasmine Kelkai, and then there's Jess Myers, as well as Elina Suon Urya uh, from the Institute itself. Well, now uh, that we're uh, having this topic of, of dreaming or dreaming of Black futures, we, we can already say that this is a very broad and, and uh, entails a lot. And it always is um, uh, important to see that uh, it depends a lot on the dreamer, what dreams are dreamt of. Um, but hopefully after this uh, evening session, uh, we will just continue the processes and, and this is just a scratch of the surface. Um, we will have a good 15 minutes in the end of this discussion for your questions. So if you have any questions for uh, the panelists, um, please uh, write them into um, the comment box. Uh, if there are a lot of similar questions, I'll just lump them, them together to be able to answer maybe like a broader question. Um, but um, other than that, um, yes, I will ask all the participants who are not the guests to uh, close their video because this is a recorded session so that um, we can focus on the guests. Uh, the, the, the panelists tonight. Um, just a few words about our panelists. So um, Jasmine Kelkai is a scholar activist and a PhD candidate in sociology at University of California, Santa Barbara, um, in a, with an interdisciplinary emphasis in Black studies. Her work explores how ideas about Blackness are circulated globally, yet shaped by local contexts, histories, and intersecting identities. And Jess Myers is a writer, editor, and podcast producer focusing on urban planning and architecture. Her podcast, Here There Be Dragons, explores the impact of security narratives and uh, uh, security narratives and security policy on urban spaces. She is an assistant professor at the Rhodes, uh, Rhode Island uh, School of Design as well. And from the host institute today, we have Elina Suoniria, who is the director of programs in the Finnish uh, Culture Institute in New York. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jasmine, Jess, and Elena for participating tonight. Um, I'm very honored to have you here speak with us. Um, just um, please uh, tell a little bit about yourself and maybe answer uh, a little bit just as a warm up about maybe how your uh, your work or your activism, uh, uh, how your dreaming affects your work or your activism. A couple of words is enough. Do you want to go first? Uh, Jess, maybe. Sure. Um, thank you again, uh, Monica and Elena, for inviting me. I really appreciate uh, the ability to be in conversation with Jasmine again, uh, which is also always very wonderful. Um, I would say, so I think that there are a lot of different ways to take dreaming. I really appreciate it as kind of like a playful term. Um, you can kind of put uh, dreaming, I think, with vision and something, especially in my research around kind of um, let's say different types of visions for urban space and different types of vision for architectural space has been really interesting to me and, and really uh, prescient in my work, just because I also think that a demand is a, is a dream, like a demand is, is a form of vision or a demand is a form of speculation, um, kind of pushing someone or pushing an institution or, or pushing um, uh, 
a prevailing sort of mainstream power system uh, in a different direction and then kind of seeing what happens. I think that sometimes vision or dream is tied into there will never be any problems again. Uh, but I think a different way of thinking of it is uh, something that a, a, a scholar on labor, Kathy Weeks, mentioned, which is that it can just be, can you imagine having very different problems from the ones that you have now, right? And that being a kind of uh, dream in itself. So that's, I think, how it shows up in my work. What about you, Jasmine? Um, a few words? <laughs> about yourself or about the dreaming. Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Monica and Elena for, for having me as well. And, and it's also great to be back in, in conversation, uh, conversation with Jess and to be able to have this conversation in a space like this in and of itself. Um, I really love what you said, Jess, about you know dreaming as just being having other problems, right? Or this kind of utopia is having other problems. And I think that's, um, in a way that's something that I think comes through in my work as well and my thinking, you know, my first uh, thought when I think of dreaming, uh, especially of dreaming, dreaming of Black futures, how it's impacted my work is I, I kind of go back to, you know, radical Black scholar Robin D.G. Kelly's, um, you know, formulation of, of, of Black freedom dreams, right, and the way that we articulate visions for the, for the future, but also for different kinds of relations. And I think for me, dreaming has been really important in not thinking about sort of dreaming as, you know, dreaming for like thinking about an outcome or thinking about a utopia that comes after struggle in some sense, right? But about dreaming kind of also playing with time and space in a way that allows us to dream of alternative ways of being and relating to each other in the now. Um, and so in this way, kind of maybe more of it in the kind of Afro-pessimist tradition of thinking about fugitivity, thinking about the ways that Black people uh, now and always have carved out pockets of joy and spaces of, of self-determination um, and different kinds of relations beyond just the, the oppressive uh, kind of institutions and, and societies that we live in. And so that's something I try to think about in my work to not just think about resistance to racism, uh, or the ways that, you know, I do want to document the ways in which we experience and are affected by and our lives are structured by racism, but I also really want to highlight the ways in which Black people find creative ways of, 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 of imagining otherwise and of living otherwise in this world right now. Thank you. Is there, a, do you want to comment, Elena? Do you want to say something a little bit about yourself, work, anything? Thank you, Monica. Also, on my part, uh, thanks so much, uh, Jasmine and Jess, for being, being part of this discussion. I'm really happy you're, you're here. And uh, thank you also, Monica, for this lovely first, first question. Um, uh, I can say like, yeah, a few words about dreaming. I think like definitely on top of this kind of daily practice of daydreaming, uh, dreaming does have some, some effect in my work as well that I'm, I'm, um, I'm aiming to do in a, from an intersectional feminist point of view. Like, and, and I guess like for me, the kind of the dreaming has a lot to do with with um, what art can do as well and what culture can do and what kind of effect uh, art, art can have on people and, and kind of from this, this angle, like what uh, dreaming of these things and dreaming of like transformation that art, art can cause, cause in someone and my, my kind of role in enabling these encounters with art. So, so yeah, I would say actually dreaming has a, important part in my work as well from that point of view. Thank you. As this already sounds like <laughs> something that just kind of could grow and grow. And I've been actually what I wanted to uh, really start now with is like actually going into uh, 
um, the starting point of like, where do we start when uh, we start dreaming about black futures? Um, like what kind of blackness or black are we even talking about? And, and what does futures mean? Are we talking about like, you know, thousands of years ahead or hundreds of years, or are we talking about next week? And, and what can we like, what can we say already about that kind of dreaming? Would someone want to start? Oh yes, Jasmine, go ahead. Um, I guess I just kind of want to throw one thing in the mix. And I think that is that for me, actually, when I start to think about dreaming of black futures, I would start by looking to the past. Um, because I think, you know, in some ways and in, in, in at least recent world history, the idea of thinking about black futures has kind of been paradox because the history of how blackness has been defined and how black people have been uh, positioned in, 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 in the world um, has been through proximity to death, right? Proximity to premature death as, as Ruthie Gil Gilmore would call it or, uh, or, or social death, right? And, and so the idea of there being black futures has always been something we've already had to fight for just in and of itself. Um, and so I think that for me, at least, I find it incredibly inspiring to, you know, not to romanticize the past and to always look to the past and past struggles, but to at least draw inspiration from that and from the myriad of ways in which we've all, it's always been about creating futures. We've had to actively create it. Uh, because again, through colonialism and and slavery, um, and the regimes that, you know in which in, in in of which you know we currently live in the wake of those regimes and and those those histories, this has always had to be an active process. So that's kind of one one place that I start. And the other thing I would say is kind of I find inspiration in looking at some of the maybe more surprising uh, places that that has manifested. Uh, and art, I think, is an excellent uh, uh, tool for that. Yes, definitely. Um, I already just, I think that the most kind of common understanding about uh, Black futures is, is very tied to also like this um, fantasy or science fiction when we're talking about and it slides into this kind of notion of uh, Afrofuturism or African futurism so kind of I like that you're actually tying it into this time and into past times and and how we can kind of uh, start from there anything to add or yes go ahead yeah, Jasmine, I really like that you're bringing up the idea that in order to understand or engage with an idea of Black future, you have to look to the past. And if I'm looking at um, Black movement work in the United States, what's interesting to see, and this is why I think uh, paying attention to demands is a really important way of understanding sort of dreaming, is how in the same way that you can look back at like, you know, what the Victorians thought the future would look like, where it's like, oh, everyone is wearing like little Victorian outfits, but like flying, you know, that kind of thing, where it's like, it's interesting to see past articulations of what people thought a future would look like, or of what people thought, um, thought like a potential could be. So you can track this through all types of media. Um, one place where I, I know that Jasmine is very well versed is music. So if you go uh, back to, um, like I come from a, a family of um, gospel singers. So if you go back through very, very old school gospel, um, it, it is depressing, but a lot of uh, very old school gospel music, um, which were many of them, which were work songs, um, the desire is transformation through death. So that was this this idea that um, we will take on this idea of like uh, of a Christian identity. Okay, fine, you know this being a part of colonialism, we'll, we'll deal with it. But there was like a real attraction to like the book of revelations, right? And like this idea that like, 
if we endure, will be transformed in death and sort of uh, able to live in this peaceable way, or even the vision of the afterlife, uh, if you are looking at the lyrics of this song, is very much about like peace, right? It's about like rest. You know, you have uh, Swing Low Sweet Chariot, which everybody knows, which is again about like a transformation, um, like, a, like a metaphysical, like a physical transformation into uh, death or into the afterlife. You have um, a study war, no more, which is a very old gospel song, which is again about like laying down like this need to endure in order to rest. So like that was one vision of the future was to be able to, you know, live in a sort of unoppressed environment, which meant to like sort of sleep and like let your, let your body kind of um, uh, sort of reject work. So there's that that piece. And then you have a generation sort of coming up, I would say, in if we're like skipping a lot of time, <laughs> time, if you're thinking about like the 40s and 50s, where you have a lot of um, American soldiers who are coming back, Black American soldiers who are coming back from World War II, who are very much influenced by the way that they were, uh, that they sort of engaged in a different type of uh, sort of mobility in Europe. But I'm not saying that they weren't sort of opposed in different ways about stereotypes uh, about Blackness and Blackness and violence and things like that. Definitely, that was also at play in those experiences. But to be able to sort of like have a mobility that wasn't possible in the United States also sort of bred the respectability movement, like respectability movements, which is very much at play in the um, civil rights movement, to dream of existing in essentially like what society was, but as an, an unmolested body. So sort of just to go to go to work and make money, have a family, have like a white picket fence kind of house. Like that was very much prevalent, especially in um, the attraction to um, what like Martin Luther King's message was and also his visual messaging, sort of to be wearing a suit, um, to be, um, using uh, empirical forms, like sort of uh, empirical forms of reasoning and the public letters that he wrote was this way of being like, okay, I can, you know, exist, like if I were to be able to exist unmolested, I would be able to sort of contribute to more or less the same sort of like frame of society, but like in an unmolested way, which uh, a lot of people became less attracted to when he began to push more into, um, class politics um, and sort of like anti-war politics as well, where he was beginning to imagine uh, before his assassination, um, this idea of like a, a class revolution and um, sort of like an, an anti-war uh, class revolution as well. Um, so I, I also see in sort of contemporary forms, sort of like the, the legacy of contending with what respectability did or did not give, but also the idea of like what, you know, transformation through religion, this idea of rest gave is that if we start to like combine those things, you begin to see this sort of like con more contemporary ideas around like care, where of course, and I, I do think that the term in many ways is, has been used a lot, but at the same time, um, it's this kind of articulation of the same sort of rest that was dreamed of with this kind of capacity to exist in life unmolested, but that it's turned in towards different types of relation within the community itself, which you can definitely see in um, Black queer writing as well as just like how can we have like different types of relation within the community where you know the the struggle with the mainstream or the struggle with the predominant power structures is still there but there is a teasing out of the struggle um, within community to found different types of relation and that being also a dream where it sort of decenters like you know opposing whiteness or dealing with white supremacy, which is always very much there, and sort of looking a little bit more inward to different types of community relations, which I think is also an interesting way to sort of like carry to Jasmine's point, this like legacy or this history of dreaming. Yeah, which kind of brings me into this kind of wondering of, 
of if if then the dream of future does it does resistance have a place in the in the dream of the future is 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 resistance the dream or the dream the resistance or does it even exist there i mean yeah i think that's that's absolutely relevant because i think and i think it's all of the above you know i think there are different ways of engaging I mean, again, in a context, in a historical context where, where resistance has been, you know, asserting dignity, right? Something that is so asserting life, right? Even just the, the example that Jess brought up about, you know, gospel and, and moving from, I mean, just think about the power and the fact that the only way you can envision freedom or the only way you can envision the future or rest is through death, not just through religious transformation, but that it's not possible in the realm of this world, right? I think that is that is immense. Um, and so when you have, you know, whether it's about uh, resistance takes very many different forms. And I, I think for sure, you know, existence is resistance, building community, love, black joy is resistance. Um, all of these things are resistance. And of course, still organized movements are of course connected to, you know, this type of resistance is of course also connected to, to dreams of the future. And that's why, you know, what Jess was talking about with the demands are so important. And I think paying attention to how society responds to those demands. And I think, especially in, in the age we live in today, also really paying attention to how and who gets to sort of interpret and translate and, and um, those demands. Because I think, you know, apropos dreams, and, you know, you brought up Dr. King, I mean, I think the, the you know, one of the hardest things uh, to think about when we're talking about dreams of Black futures is, you know, what sort of happened to the memory of Dr. King and, and the way that the I have a dream speech, right, is utilized and uh, cropped to say that, you know, it's about children being able to play side by side. Well, this also allows us, if you reformulate, right, Dr. King's dreams to something that is palatable, it also then allows you to say, well, we've made it, right? We've made it. And so therefore there's no more struggle. There's no more, you know, we don't need to work on these issues anymore. So there's kind of an insidiousness also to, uh, or at least a, a, a problem in that kind of, um, and, and resistance only being thought of as something that pushes against or that demands uh, recognition from powers that be, right? Um, it doesn't mean that I don't that it's not valuable, right? That's not also a necessary part of the transformations that we want to see. But I think history teaches us that uh, it can very easily be kind of co-opted and folded back into uh, the power structure. And that's why I think these relations, right, are so important. Um, that we that in in our dreaming, that it's not just about, um, for example, another thing that Jess brought up was, you know. This sort of respectability frame. And I think this is something that is a huge part of how we think about anti-racism, how we think about um, feminism as well. The idea that, you know, what we're striving for is equality with white men. That if it wasn't, if but for my skin color or but for my gender, I was, I could live exactly like this. That doesn't actually work to alter any of our relations, material relations, social relations in the world. Um, and so it's this kind of piecemeal thing that that also fundamentally leaves a very inhumane structure in place. And so, yeah, I think there's obviously a relationship there, but I, I'm kind of like, that's why I'm more interested in this sort of black feminist, black radical um, and indigenous, like also, I mean, this is not, these are not just ideas that come out of, you know, the post-civil rights movement struggle in the US, right? Like these are things that have been part of kind of, I think Africanist traditions um, and indigenous traditions of resistance always. And so to kind of follow the kernels of that, the ways that we can work to change the system, but also create these pockets beyond, right? And that's always been a, been the case also in the United States where you had, um, you know, there was the, the civil rights movement that sought to seek change through the rights discourse, but then there's also a lot of people who fought for self-determination, who fought for, we're pro-segregationists because of these particular dynamics and what that meant. Um, and then you have obviously maroonage and you know uh, people who 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 um, 
were fugitives from from slave society and created their alternate alternate societies. And we have this in you know the continent as well, and so forth and so forth. So just to say that I think there are different ways to look at resistance and different ways to look at this dreaming. Yeah, again, this is why I love talking to Jasmine so much because we're in very much, we're in very different fields, but it is so great to sort of think think with someone um, and how much uh, the research and the, our sort of uh, own directions have led to such similar places. I, I really love that you brought up, you know, um, obviously the I, the way that the I Have a Dream speech is like heavily edited because it also uh, brings up the fact that now the I Have a Dream speech because of this sort of like anti-critical race theory, like et cetera, uh, nonsense that's happening in the United States, you can't teach that anymore in Texas <laughs> uh, at all, not even, the vet, not even the edited version, <laughs> which is again, the most like, you know, uh, sort of whitewashed <laughs> version of the of that speech like it it not even that is allowed anymore because again like to go back to another point that you were that you were making about asserting life and that being sort of the most um in a way like the radical edge of like most movements which is really it's really interesting to see uh, in movement work is I kind I kind of feel like the way to vet kind of the the seriousness of the work as opposed to just you know again what you were talking about Jasmine this like need to only be uh, in uh, in an oppositional stance is to let's sort of vet the stance or vet the demands vet the the vision for how demanding of life it is. So this is the way that we can very much tie the demands of uh, like radical black movements in with radical indigenous movements in with uh, climate justice, environmental justice movements, because all of these things are looking to demand survival. You know, um, I think that uh, sometimes even in uh, and sometimes, especially in uh, progressive movements, you we are seeing we we are in a way seeing how more reactionary or conservative or uh, like far right movements are almost like setting the agenda for progressivism by saying like here's this absolutely insane like death wish that we have, and then everyone is caught up in opposing it like no 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 don't do that but it it makes which shortens or makes it more complicated uh or like absolutely uh removes the oxygen from people who are trying to find a different way of being alive <laughs> of like you know to borrow uh from sylvia winters of like being human differently like fundamentally like this building block of just it, of just humanity, you know, sort of reestablishing or re-upping the uh, importance and dignity of humanity. And I know there are some, obviously some movements that are just like, all right, yeah, so we're all human beings. So like, what is it? Why should we even go? But at the same time, it's just like, because of all these different experiences in resisting um, uh, hegemonic, these sort of um prevailing powers the sort of like drive for white supremacy um have all also been movements for the survival <laughs> of human life you know to create different relations right to create um a different way of relating to each other but understanding that the the dignity each of our dignity is tied into our capacity to survive just like that on the most fundamental level is really what these demands have been making clear, making more and more clear. Um, because again, if you participate continuously in like regimes of like aggression, regimes of coercion, it's all you will have because there don't exist relations where you can move towards solutions that will radically change how human beings relate to the earth or how human beings exist on the earth in a way that sustains life 
you know, you don't have to do that in a coercive way. Like if you, you if you just look at like what came out of, you know, COP26 and how the demands from African nation states and also island nation states and um, global south nation states are absolutely like oh, pushed to the side uh, for the continuation or reproduction of the sort of post industrialized and extractive lifestyles of the West, you'll see that you can see the demands of that document as a as a future that in many ways negates life. You know what I mean? Whereas at the same time, when you look, if we're again focusing back in on like the Black radical tradition, you are seeing demands that are trying to essentially promote survival. I'm wondering now with Elena, like with the in institutions, how um, have you, like, has there been any occasions where um, this kind of, cause you're a curator and then kind of the Institute is part of, of, of the culture and art scene. Um, have these themes come up in, in the artists coming in and the artists um, wanting to present something like this or, and, and how, how have these spaces that you, for example, have as, as institutes, how have, um, how have they been working in those spaces? Um, I maybe don't have any like kind of concrete examples like directly referring to this, but I, uh, what I was just thinking now, listening to this and definitely agreeing with, with kind of, um, kind of uh, dreaming and aiming towards this kind of uh, a more, more like a broader view of like an equal, equal art scene and equal society and like kind of how the Institute can use its resources for that. So uh, that's definitely something that's, that's part of our, our mission and how, what, what we want to do and like just, and even like overall thinking of this this discussion like what what an institute's role can be in this so it's very much about like uh being an ally and and then like i said like using using the resources we have in in enabling enabling like bringing forth practices and enabling discussions like this and um but yeah, it's a good question, and I wish I had like something really concrete I could present you with. But, but yeah, not yet, not yet. But it's coming. Yeah, it's yeah. coming. Hopefully, yes. Sure Which kind of is. brings me, yeah, brings me back to kind of um, what maybe like um, maybe Jasmine kind of sparked in me, uh, and I started thinking about um, like, maybe this is for Jasmine or who calls Jess and all of you, but I was thinking about um, what can we already see? Like, can we see some futures already? Or can we see some black futures happening already? And some, some, some kind of um, dreaming of black futures already existing in the sense of like, that we are living it or that, um, we are step by step, I think that for individuals, of course, but like step by step going towards it already. Yeah, I mean, definitely we can we can see that in different contexts, but I guess to kind of bring it back home to, to thinking about Finland, you know, I think apropos what Jess was talking about before, I think one of the sort of challenges is precisely how much the conversation in Finland um, and in Sweden as well, um, and I refer to these two contexts because it's the ones I know best, but how much of the conversation is constrained precisely by the framing of either sort of conservative, uh, you know, true Finn, Sweden Democrats sort of uh, narratives through it's constrained because it's always in relation to neo-Nazism, right, like these kind of extreme forms of racism, and it's also constrained because it's, we're always pushing up against sort of, um, you know, uh, narratives around Nordic exceptionalism and the image that we have of the Nordics as these sort of social democratic uh, equal welfare states. And I think these these narratives, right, I think are a big part also of what constrains um, the actual discourse around racism. Um, and that also impacts, of course, the, the movements that exist and the ways in which, right, we also push for change because it's always in, in responding to this. 
Um, and I think that also, of course, impacts then what art gets created and so forth. However, I think what's also so powerful about the Black and African diaspora is the ways in which we've always kind of had created sort of means for engaging um, across context and engaging across, you know, across oceans, across continents, and, and utilizing those connections as resources. Of course, one of the reasons that we've engaged across contexts is because we've been transported across contexts, but also even in sort of our diasporic being, right, there's a lot of resources that are drawn from there uh, in the sort of dreaming. And I think if we look to uh, Finland now, if I, if I take particularly Finland, I think the arts and culture is kind of where you see the most kind of radical dreaming um, happening. Um, and in my work, I look at, for example, hip hop and, um, the way that hip hop, of course, in part because of sort of its history and its place as an African diasporic cultural form is one thing, but also I think because until at least recently, it hasn't been as mainstreamed as other genres uh, of music. And I think uh, that's allowed for a different kind of democratic participation and with YouTube and so forth, right? There's a lot that can happen within this scene that isn't controlled by mainstream institutes, record companies, and so forth in a way that uh, other genres of music and other forms of cultural expression are. And so I think you see a lot of stuff, um, you've seen stuff in the last uh, 10 years or so that really engages with these ideas of what it means to be Black in Finland, what it means to create alternative spheres of belonging. So even if there's this kind of general sense of rejection and exclusion and, um, from Finnish society, this music is one way that people create these alternative pockets of belonging. And I think you're, you're seeing it through music, but you're also seeing it mirrored in music. Uh, and I think, for example, somebody like Yeboya is like a great example of this because she engages with this a lot in her work, both lyrically, but also visually, right? What does it mean to, to create art where you see black and brown bodies, where you see black joy? Uh, where she's also said explicitly, right, that there's been a shift in thinking and going from sort of creating art to speak back to the white mainstream to actually what does it mean to actually create content that is for us, that is about actually sort of creating these alternative uh, conversations and communities. And I mean, there are lots of other like community-based, I think, collectives and mobilizations that do this through creating alternative spaces, physical meeting spaces, but also uh, different kinds of arts and culture, whether through film, whether through poetry, through writing, right? Um, that a way of, you know, you can create, you, you're actively creating a community into existence. And I think um, when it comes to social issues, I think in Sweden, we're a little bit further ahead with some of these things in terms of the conversation. And there, I think I would sort of refer to, I think the Black queer spaces have been particularly important in, in, in building these alternative spheres and alternative discourses. Um, but I'm also seeing a lot more, you know, again, spaces being created, black spaces being created that are not just about resisting racism, right? They're also about just creating spaces for black women, for example, or where you're starting to see mobilizations around alternative ways of relating to the state or relating to the question of safety in particular. So this sort of abolitionist, uh, thinking and conversation and organizing that's starting to happen. And that's precisely because of, you know, decades of trying to, trying one particular strategy that hasn't worked and, 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 and trying other things on, but also because of this transnational, I think, conversation that happens between activists and that we get also these influences through the culture, through cultures uh, that circulate in a way that gives us the resources to try to kind of localize and and remix, right, um, different potential solutions and tools in creative ways. Just before Jess continues, I'm just gonna uh, remind the audience members, if you have any questions uh, for the panelists, please write them in the, the chat box and, and uh, I'll be asking them in a few minutes, but before that, I'll let Jess uh, continue from here. Yeah, I, 
I think, again, in the Swedish context, I really agree with you about, you know, the way that um, Black queer spaces are kind of pushing forward um, these different sets of demands that aren't, you know, necessarily constantly being influenced by what the far right is doing or by necessarily even what the state is doing. And here I really have to call out um, Samuel Girma and really have to call out Asenia Gray, who are both sort of, you know, culture creators, but also um, people who have been instrumental, um, at least in my experience in Stockholm, truly really in instrumental in the creation of spaces. And when I say creating space, I, what I actually mean is the creation of an ability to relate with others in a different way. They have been two people who have really pushed that hard, who have dedicated like their careers to that. And at the same time, aren't recognized for it at all, right? Are continuously, you know, marginalized in their careers, um, despite the fact that they are experts, like with precision of creating those possibilities. So that's definitely where I see, um, uh, where I see sort of future, um, being built up, built up, or vision and demand being built up in a different way, um, and at the same time, um, thinking about how uh, a relation to the state is also changing. You know, this is where I think that both indigenous and immigrant movements together have this capacity. Uh, that's really interesting capacity of challenging the state. So like the legitimacy of states, nation states in general. So, you know, if you're making these demands about, you know, what is it to be American or what is it to be Finnish or what is it to be a Swede, you are faced again with all these obstacles of people being like, well, I'm indigenous. So I don't think that the state is legitimate at all. I don't think it actually exists. And like having, just like putting that, out as just being like, you know, what is a true fin? It doesn't exist. That's what it, like, this is what sort of like indigenous, um, uh, indigenous sort of uh, theory has really been pushing. It's just like, why are you so addicted to a nation state when it's not even legitimate? And at the same time, you have immigrant movements coming in and saying like, why should I be barred by this fake invisible line, you know, in, uh, you know, drawn by who, drawn by power in place, like, why should I be barred from this place? Why should I be told that I don't belong here? Why should I be told that like my existence here is illegitimate when this line is illegitimate, right? So to think beyond just uh, the kind of, you know, diversity and inclusion mindset that was very popularized in the 90s of saying, you know, we will welcome you in and you can be just like us. It goes beyond that saying like, just like you, who are you? What is this? You know what I mean? Why should I buy into the, the legitimacy of this being a united identity when I don't believe that it is? And if that's the case, then why should I not belong here? You know? that question, I think um, pushing it to, I think, again, the the edge of not being uh, stopped, of not having the frame set for you, but resetting the frame for yourself. So this idea that like, I don't have to, like, I, I don't have to prove that I am this national identity, you know, I can create a different set of relations for myself because I don't believe in this national identity. I think that's, I, I think that 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 is vision. Um, that is that as a demand is vision. And at the same time, you know, in the at least uh, thinking about um, scenarios in the US, which I'm sure is very much the same about how uh, locality then creates different different ways of relating where, you know, I live in a neighborhood that is uh, in Brooklyn that's very Caribbean and I um, volunteer with the community garden that's in my neighborhood. And I'm being taught by Caribbean aunties like different things about how they grow, how, how they protect seeds, how they grow different things. Um, and I see that as a form of relating, you know, the, the neighborhood itself is interesting because the relation of neighbor means that I don't get to choose who I'm in proximity with, but I can choose to show up in that relationship to know who my neighbors are to, uh, take lessons from, from my neighbors, to be in humility uh, with my neighbors, as opposed to coming into a space, um, 
in a more gentrifying mindset where it's like, I, I know as someone who works at an institution, I make a certain amount of money that's more than uh, what is common in my neighborhood. But at the same time, I can show up to that with a sense of humility as opposed to saying that I get to dictate the terms of what's happening in the neighborhood. You know? And I think that for me has really been uh, a lesson in creating new forms of relation and like the generosity of people um, who have allowed me to, to, to take part in older relations that have existed in this neighborhood. And does this, um, just, oh yes, please, Elena, please. Yeah, this, this uh, discussion on like kind of creating spaces um, uh, made me think of a project that I am actually working on at the moment with the amazing Pehme Collective, so the Soft Collective, who are based in Helsinki. And I am working with them in relation to actually the Institute Network's larger project like Together Alone 2.0. And their current project is all about um, like creating, uh, and I think also about dreaming and then actually doing it. So creating, uh, it, so the project is called Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations. And it, it's all about like creating a space that doesn't exist and that is needed by, by um, queer people of color or people of color in, in Helsinki, especially like, or in Finland, which is really obvious that these spaces are needed. And yeah, so kind of this definitely relates to these discussions of like dreaming and, and kind of uh, creating the space that's needed and kind of communal communal space, spaces and spaces for care for each other. And um, yeah, kind of, yeah. So it, it reminded of that and that there actually is a project that I am working on in these matters. Yeah, definitely. Which also like brings me to, because we have been talking about um, queer, um, black queer, um, um spaces and other i was thinking of now that we're like getting into this kind of um nationality and nation state kind of discussion i was thinking of also like does blackness exist in the future like is is it part of the dream like that we still dream of blackness and 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 like or is it is it to go beyond that um and kind of think of ways of just being uh without any kind of i wouldn't say category or, or label or anything but that kind of uh, uh, uh identification to something i mean i think um yeah i think i think it's tricky i think that can easily get into the territory of like you know what we want to the future is color blindness and we're all human you know um, and, and, and I mean, yes, and when it comes to our, when it comes to, you know, structure and, and like, I mean, in some ways, right, we want, we want that, we want, we want it to not be defining of us, but I think for me, I come back to, you know, when you think about Blackness, I think more about it, it's, it's about altering what that, that means or allowing for a different idea of Blackness to be the dominant idea, I suppose, because I don't think it's, the way we think about blackness today um i mean for good and bad right it's, it's so defined by whiteness whiteness is defined in relation to blackness and so i mean i i see a future where we can abolish whiteness uh i don't seek to abolish blackness um i hope just that blackness can sort of transform uh into something into something have a different meaning, I guess, in a system of different social relations. Um, but I don't know, I don't know that I see the goal uh, of the future or of liberation as being abolishing, you know, or, or getting rid of, or getting beyond Blackness, because I think, again, what Black people have done with anti-Blackness, um, and with the construction of blackness is still creating something that is so much more than that and that i think is is really potent um, with potential and possibilities 
Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's about taking that Sylvia Winter question and applying it again of just like uh, Blackness differently. How can we think of uh, Blackness in a world where the problems are different, in a world where being human is different? You know, I, I in many ways have sought to see, you know, diaspora as a kind of nation state, right? And like blackness being my hometown and like American blackness being my neighborhood, right? So this is a way of sort of navigating a relation, like sort of these nested relations with others is like, how can I think about, you know, my specificity in, in relation to others, which I think often gets lost, you know, to be black in the United States is a very different set of power relationships than it is to be black in Finland, than it is to be black in Sweden, than it is to be black in France. Um, and those dynamics, I think, can sometimes get lost uh, sometimes in like a trans diasporic conversation because often uh, times, and I'm very uh, cognizant of this, is that, you know, Black American discourse often gets to be like the loudest, <laughs> right? So, um, and, you know, I say that with a lot of, you know, love and re respect and humility towards, you know, the Black American radical tradition, but at the same time have like learned so much from different diasporic neighborhoods, let's say, and then outside to be in relation with other diasporas too, of other, you know, of um, sort of movements or migrations um, that were sparked by different pressures and different power relations and that creating sort of like the way that they, it, that people exist in their context, you know, creates that difference. And then to be in relationship to that difference, I think uh, uh, does create something new, does continue to create sort of like new forms of knowledge, new forms of um, surviving new forms of sort of pushing towards um, a dignified life. I love that. And I mean, I think that's fundamentally what the diaspora, like what the history of the diaspora has been um, and what dreaming is, right? It's about, it's about how, how, can, how can we flip the script? How can we change those relations? I mean, the, the hist history is there. The, dyna the dynamics are set, but we can take the ingredients and make something different with it. And that's the type of stuff and seeing it also that type of thinking more and more is something that really um, is inspiring to me. And that kind of gives me, gives me a lot of hope for, I don't know, for all the things we haven't even cooked up yet. Never know. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is um, this is also like like I said in the beginning. It's just scratching the surface when there's like so much. The the diaspora is just like absolutely massive, and it, it has all these kind of um, what would I call them like dimensions to it that brings more to this narrative than just like just said like yeah, it's dominated by. At the moment, it's dominated by the the African American. But what can happen? Like, what can what's coming up, and like what's cooking up? And I'm thinking about, you know, um, also how just just for us in in Finland, how we are kind of still a little bit stuck in that box of being in Finland. But what can we do when we kind of let ourselves free from that box? And and go yeah but that's that's the importance of dreaming right like that's the importance of really daring to dream of different relations different possibilities different alternatives to what we have um and recognizing that we can put those things into practice now in different ways and that that's you know that's part of it so there are dreams we haven't even dreamt yet Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. And I think that sometimes these conversations, like the conversation of dreaming gets dismissed as utopian, but at the same time, uh, 
<laughs> it's so funny that it is easier. It's so so much easier if you look at media to to dream of dystopia than it is to uh, dream of utopia. Because how of how often it is dismissed as like impractical, unachievable, et cetera, et cetera. But if you if you reformat uh, how you think of utopia in terms of like the smallness of uh, creating a different set of relations with those around you, a, a stronger, uh, more reciprocal set of re relations with those with those around you, that small move is is a utopia, is a kind of utopia because then you get to explore, like I was saying at the beginning, like this different set, a different set of problems, a different set of uh, of relations, and I think that you know often when we are talking about resistance or movement work or things like that we think in terms of really large the way that we're taught history in this really large grand way such that we uh we're, are not really taught to scale that down to um the personal to the individual and the the small uh triumphs or the small progresses that exist uh that exist there um, not to be satisfied that with that as the only changes that can happen, but to recognize that as a form of change, as a form of resistance, and, and ultimately utopia is uh, is huge. Um, and when you start to gain more and more momentum with people who are interested in that kind of work, you do end up with these, you know, larger, um, flashier, let's say, um, uh, movements. Thank you so much, Jasmine, Jess, Elena. Um, Elena, do you wanna have a quick quick note on that? Um, um, we are running out of time. Uh, I can give you some extra five minutes if there's something uh, that people want to still share. But thank you so much everyone who participated today. Uh, it's been a pleasure sharing this space and sharing this discussion with you. Um, and this is actually for this year, the last discussion that we're having with the In Conversations with uh, the Finnish Institutes, and we'll be continuing uh, next year, January. So keep yourself posted, um, follow the Finnish Institutes on Instagram, on Facebook, to be uh, more up to date what, what's happening. Um, yeah, Elena, would you want to say some last words on on today's uh, or to this session? Well, I think, uh, well, what I can say is like huge thank you to Chess and Jasmine for for being in the discussion and to you as well, Monica. So uh, as you said in the beginning, like, beginning a discussion about dreaming and I hope we can continue it in different ways ways after this as well so I think like as the last word I would be happy to just say thank you thank you um yeah let's continue dreaming <laughs>